Look at that. We are live on another we Monday. <laughs> we are live, Dusty, on another Monday morning edition of Coffee with Rich. This morning, I'm joined by Dusty Solomon. And here in just a second, I'm going to introduce him and officially and read his bio. But before we do, let's do some sponsors so that we can pay for this train to stay on the tracks. Uh, let's see. We got amazing sponsors like Century Martial Arts, makers of the Bob XL. I'm looking at my Bob over there in the corner, giving me that mean look. Bob, you're going to get it today, pal. I can promise you that. <clears throat> Might even give old Bob some leg kicks. You know, like Mike Seeklander always says, why well, just do cardio? Zombie land requires cardio, right? We all know that. That's the first rule of zombie land. Well, why not do some cardio on the Bob XL? Get a little striking routine going. Pick them up. You can shoot them, take them to the range. You know, a three-dimensional target on the range is pretty amazing. Check them out as well as an amazing discount that you're going to get just by being a viewer of Coffee with Rich. You can find everything in today's show notes. There's a link there, AmericanWarriorShow.com. It will take you right to our sponsors page. You can click the links and find out more about our amazing sponsors as well as pick up discount codes. APPHemp.com. That's my good friends, Jesse Ross and his beautiful family growing some amazing CBD products in the mountains of Asheville, North Carolina. And they have all the things that you need if you want to get better sleep, perform better cognitively. If you got some issues with joint pain like I do, I'll be going to jujitsu tonight and getting crushed under some big young fellas. Pick up some CBD products at APPHint.com and get a discount code for watching today's show. Cool Fire Trainer, as Dusty will tell you, ammunition prices, although they're coming back down, Dusty. They are still a little astronomical, though. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So anyway, here. They, they are not they are not that good when we're used to paying, you know, $9 a box or something like that for 115 grain 9 mil. It ain't that way right now. <clears throat> so pick up a cool fire trainer and take your dry fire routine to the next level. It's your gun, your sights, felt recoil. It's an amazing tool. If you're a trainer, I, I definitely think it can take your training to the next level. Mountain Man Medical, we finally have that, as promised, co-branded trauma kit. And like I told you, you know, my son is going back to finish up his master's here in a couple of weeks. And if you have a son or daughter heading off to college, you might want to get them one of those trauma kits to take to the dorm with them. Uh, put one in your car, et cetera. We've, we've purposely kept the price down over there at Mountain Man Medical. Check out our cold branded trauma kit. You're going to want to check check out those. Uh, PrecisionHolsters.com, man. Maker of the Ultra Appendix holsters that Mike and I use. You're definitely going to want to check them out. They also have an amazing competition line. So without further ado, now that we've got uh, sponsor reads out of the way, Dusty, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, good to have you. We got 10 folks joining us live. Please and hit that share button. I'm going to read. Most of you may know uh, Dusty's products, but you may not know the face. He is uh, over there at buildingshooters.com, uh, the author of several books, and I've got many of them here this morning on training. Let's see what else we got here, Dusty. <laughs> Building Shooters, amazing book. And another one, men mentoring shooters. And uh, I keep these close at hand. They're good stuff. And if you are a trainer if you, and you're not reading his works, you're doing something wrong. Let's welcome people to the show. And then we'll uh, read Dusty's bio here. Tony is on from Brunswick, Georgia. Dale is on. Good morning, Dale. Jesse is on. Says, good morning, gentlemen. My good friend, Will Parker out there in Montana. It's coin number 800. And if you wonder what a coin number is, you're going to have to check out AmericanWarriorSociety.com. Take 14-day free trial and see what the American War Study has to offer you in self-defense. Uh, James Vick is on. Good morning, sir. Mr. Jeff Brown, my brother, retired law enforcement officer. Good morning, Jeff. Jason is on. Says, good morning, gentlemen, from north central Kansas. John is on from Oklahoma, coin number 1919. My name is Rich Brown. I'm the co-host, co-founder of the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show. America's number one self-defense podcast. I'm a retired Marine Corps officer, former police officer, corrections officer, and special operations officer. And uh, Dusty, I guess now's as good a time as any to read your bio. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dusty is a former naval officer who specializes in security, protection, and training development between the military and private sector. He has conducted 20 overseas deployments, was a founding member of the Director of Training for Sealed Mindset, now Defensive Mindset Training, and as a member of the SMEAC Consulting Group. 
Dustin is a certified law enforcement firearms instructor in multidisciplines and designed the weapons training programs at multiple military commands. He has a Bachelor of Science from the United States Naval Academy, a master's degree in security management, and is an ASIS certified protection specialist. He is the author of Building Shooters, Mentoring Shooters on Training, Volume 1 on Training, Volume 2, Becoming Shooters, Neuro and Hitting in Combat, and is the inventor of Neuro Shooting System, which is patent pending. Welcome to the show, brother. Thanks. Thanks for... Uh, it's great to be here. <clears throat> yeah, it's great to have you. We have... Uh, you know, Dusty has been on the show before. Mike interviewed him years ago. And, of course, we had yeah. John Marvel on about a year or so ago. Yeah. Uh, John works for or with Dusty. I don't know. How do you say that? For you or with you? Well, I mean, I guess uh, technically he works for me, but I think it's more like I work for him most of the time. <laughs> cause John, is a, John is a smart, really smart dude. So Yeah, John's an amazing guy. Uh, Dusty, what does that bio overlook? Yeah, so I guess – people like to make an assumption sometimes or whatever if you're if you're trying to do something in this industry it's because you came uh or if i guess if you have something to offer is maybe the better way to say it um you came out of some you know super secret you know high speed thing or whatever and that's um ironically the fact that i didn't um and it was just you know regular navy guy is kind of what led to uh led to everything that that we're doing with building shooters. Um, you know, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting when you hear and you talk to guys that have come from specialized units, right. And, uh, are really, really good at what they do. Really good shooters. And they start talking about the training resources that they have. <laughs> it's like, well, great. You know, you got uh shooting 150,000 rounds a year, you know, like that. That's fantastic. I don't know if that helps the average person all that much or, you know, not that the techniques don't, but the way that you got to where you're at uh, might not be applicable for everybody. Um, and so coming off of a, you know, a, you know, just a, a, a surface ship background where there was, you know, no range and 2000 rounds a year for the entire ship uh, for an NCEA, it was kind of a, an entirely different experience that I think aligns a lot more, um, with the experiences that most people have, uh, you know, law enforcement and civilian and security. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. That, that's, that's so true, man. Uh, you know, especially uh, law enforcement. I think uh, yeah. if, if you were a shooter, when I was a cop, they'd give you like 50 rounds a month and you had right. to, you had to sign for it and beg for it. And, and then next month you could get another 50. And I think I was one of the only officers that, that actually made them give it to me. <laughs> But as you know, 50 rounds ain't going to do anything a month. No. Um, let's see. Uh, how did you get into the Naval Academy, Dusty? Uh, I, I think that's, I mean, that's kind of an individual, I guess, an individual thing for everybody, right? Like John's, John's path in was very different than mine. Um, so for me, it was kind of the only thing I really ever wanted to do, uh, you know, growing up for whatever reason. So just to kind of put my head down I was the kid uh, doing his physics homework, second semester, senior year in the corner of the lunchroom. You know? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, did a uh, three season sports all through high school and, you know, boy scouts and all that stuff and got an appointment and went. Yeah. A, a lot of people I know that went to the, the, the boat school, you know, they were like, man, I should have went to Auburn and did NROTC or something <laughs> like that, you know? And, uh, yeah, I just, I went to, uh, so, so my, one of my brothers is in Naval Academy grad also. He was class of 2001 and he had, uh, I guess it was his senior, first year we call it, but senior year. Um, I don't remember where it was, but he had a, uh, uh Tennis tournament. He, he was captain of the tennis team. They had a tennis tournament somewhere that was relatively close to where I was at the time. So I drove to the, uh, And uh, I just, it was like a Friday night and he had to go to bed early. So I'm just like wandering around this, this college campus on Friday. And I was like, I was so robbed. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted back. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I hear. Uh, your microphone, Dusty, pull it a little closer to your face. All right, your, better now? There we go. Much better. 
Paul is joining us from Niagara Falls, New York, and Dale is on from Hershey. Take a quick second and uh, hit that share button before we get going much further, because what we're going to talk about this morning is incredibly important. I know a lot of you joining me this morning are current former law enforcement or firearms trainers. And if, if you're not doing your training in context with a little bit of neuroscience, I think you're wrong. So how did you get into neuroscience? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I taught a, uh, so I got out of the Navy and developed some stuff that I thought, um, I guess let me reframe that. I recognized that we had a problem, right? Which basically amounted to when I was at the security detachment um, and got our, uh, you know, the, all, all of our teams came in for an advanced weapons training block that I taught um, and recognized most of the guys didn't have a consistent grip on the handgun, right? They were all military. Well, not all of them, but most of them were military police officers before they came to the command. They've been through between four and six weeks of weapons training actually at the command. So a lot of resources had gone into training them, but we got people without a consistent grip on the handgun. So I'm having to, in a lot of ways, start at ground zero, right? And, and try to go from there. And so it's like, man, like if, if we're doing six weeks of weapons training, um, there's a problem, right? And, and, and we don't have a consistent grip on the handgun. Um, and that kind of brought me back to what I had done on the ship when I didn't, didn't even have a range, right? I could barely get ammo. Um, and seeing that, you know, the, the, the competency levels were not significantly different between these two groups of people. So even though I didn't think what I did on the ship was very good training, why did it work almost as well as, as six weeks of, of dedicated range time, right? That was, that was kind of the project. Um, and so when I'd be back from deployment, when I was contracting, uh, you know, I'd find, find somebody and be like, Hey, you want to learn to shoot? And I go teach him and kind of tweak the stuff I did on the ship and came up with, uh, what I thought was a, was a pretty solid curriculum. Um, and that was where Larry and I started seal mindset, um, up, up in Minneapolis as a, a joint veteran with rain systems. And that's, um, still going under another name. Um, uh, defensive mindset training, I think is, is the name of it now. But, um, anyway, so I, I, left the company because we ran out of money before we uh, found out a commercially viable method of delivery um, and uh, ended up going back overseas. And I was, you know, back for deployment about a year later and a friend of mine had moved out to a rural area um, and wanted to do a self-defense shotgun class. And I was like, yeah, you know, sure, no problem. Um, and so I was explaining what we do and how we apply it. And my, my friend happened to be a research neuroscientist with the Air Force Research Laboratory. And so her commentary to me after the class was, you know, what you're doing is actually some really cutting edge stuff. And she gave me a couple things to go look up. And so, you know, I was like, well, that, what I would really like to do is take this training methodology because I know it works, right? I've been now teaching it for years, right? And I understand what the impact on the students can be. Um, and I'd like to be able to take this and drive it into the professional side, which is really where my passion is, right? The arm, armed workforce management, if you want to put a, a technical spin on it. Um, and to be able to explain the science behind it would probably be helpful, right? Because people want to know that. So I sat down to spend a week and write a 15-page white paper in like three and a half years. And 200 pages later, I had the, the what is now the book Building Shooters. Um and so it's it's not so much that I got into neuroscience is just I was trying to understand what it is that explains what I've been seeing with students on the range and in my own performance, right? Both but both, both the wins and the, and the failures, <laughs> so many of those. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's kind of how that that window happened. Was a a friend of mine went through a class and said, you know, you need to go look up some of this stuff. Uh, kind of went from there. Yeah, outstanding. Yeah. We're going to unpack a lot of that today. Yeah, let's Tony, do it. Yeah, Tony says, as an instructor, I am an avid student of building shooters. Two questions. How do we incorporate this process into one-day basic classes, and what should be what should be way to test for competency? Yeah, that's a really good question, Tony. So um, I'll, hit the, I'll hit the first part of this first. So you're – you're limited in a one-day class with just the, the limitations of how the brain, you know, receives and processes information. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I'll just hit, for anybody that isn't familiar with it, I'll just hit the cognitive architecture really, really quick, right? So we've got 
anything that comes into your brain, we're talking about a brand brand new information you haven't seen before comes in and it has to go through a filter, right? And we can talk about some of the application of this later. Um, most of what we receive, like 90% of it gets blocked by that filter, right? So that's kind of your first barrier as an instructor is getting information through the filter that the student has. Um, the uh, Once you get information through that filter, it goes into what's called short-term memory, which is very much like a computer's RAM or random access memory. So stuff can go in there. You can work with it. You can process it. You can pull stuff out of it. But none of that's going to be retained. It's basically a temporary storage space. Um, if the brain's going to retain something, it has to recognize that it's important. And then it has to take it and transfer it out of that short-term memory system and put it into long-term memory. And there are two long-term memory systems. The first one is called declarative memory and the second one is called procedural. Um, or at least that's how uh, the kind of current models of cognitive architecture are breaking it down. Declarative memory is conscious access. So that's what I think about and I go get the information. Procedural memory is unconscious access. I can't get it consciously and it's what's gonna happen. Um, be just kind of naturally or unconsciously. And it's for us as trainers, it's important to know that the procedural memory system um, is what we access um, when we go sympathetic, right? If I can't think about it, it's just whatever's in procedural memory is what's going to come out. So I know Tony already knows all that. Um, I just wanted to kind of frame that as cognitive architecture. So because of the limitations of short-term memory, we're very limited in how much information we can actually teach students that might make it into long-term memory. Uh, because as I give people more information than the short-term memory system can hold, I do one of two things. I either push information out of short-term memory or I basically create what I like to describe as a corrupted data file, right? Where I've got a data file that the brain doesn't have the correct information in it because I just put all this other stuff on top of it and basically overwritten it, right? And the corrupted data file is really the best way to think of that. So, um, so back to Tony's question, um, there's, a, there's a section in On Training Volume 2, um, and Tony, if you can hit me up on PM, uh, we can go into some more detail after, uh, um, after this or, or shoot me an email. Um, the... Uh, um, so there, there's a there's a technique that I call uh, regressive stabilization, which can be very helpful in a one day class, right? So you're you're still dealing with the limitations of how the brain receives, processes, and stores information. Um, did I drop out there? Or okay, Rich, Rich put himself on a uh, um, on mute. Yeah, so I was like, <laughs> what happened? Um, but there's still some things that you can do and that we can look at in terms of. Um, how information stabilizes and how it gets corrupted. And so um, regressive stabilization is, that's a term I made up because it sounds sciencey, but it's also, <laughs> it's also descriptive of, um, of what you're actually doing, right? So understand that you're gonna be limited, not so much in what information you can present to the student, but in what you can take a, a, at least a good swing at the student retaining, right? And what the student's going to be able to retain is not going to be bigger than, than those, the, those limitations of short-term memory. All right, so the, the, the purpose of the regressive stabilization technique is you're going to try to attempt to, A, make the brain recognize that the information that you've selected the student to learn to be important, and then um, to prevent it from being corrupted. Right, so they need to know it's important and it needs to be not corrupted if there's gonna be a chance they retain it. So in kind of that standard one day basic class, right, um, uh, obviously one of the challenges is that a, a lot of times in an open class, you can be dealing with students that are all across the spectrum, right? And that's tremendously uh, difficult to deal with, right? So um, like, I mean, I know, Rich, like you and Mike, right? You guys get people from all across the spectrum showing up in a class. You might get a guy like John showing up in a class, right? And then, you know, next to him might be a guy that's like, all right, I'm, I'm a little unsure about the loading and unloading. And, you know, I'm still using the, you know, this little you know, holding the other arm with my arm kind of grip because I saw it in field and stream in 1932 or something, right? And so you, you've right. kind of got, yeah, so you've got this huge spectrum of people that are showing up and it's very difficult to deliver um uh deliver content that's relevant to that entire entire group right in an open class um so 
recognizing with that limitation, um, you can pick, and, and I guess it would be, I, I'll say I have not, I can't think of a time when I have done this, but it would be, I guess, possible to kind of segment your class if you end up with some very disparate people and, and pick these topics to be different for different groups of people in the class. That that would be a possible thing to do as well if you do run into that. Although I say I haven't done that personally, um, but so you're gonna you're gonna pick a a segment of information or a skill or whatever that is in the correct order progressively. And I don't mean it, it progressive in a political way. I mean that firearm skills build upon each other, right? So yeah. if I'm going to draw the gun, there's a whole series of skills involved in drawing the gun, right? So uh, grip, trigger management, recoil management, uh, flash sight picture, whatever, you, whatever, whatever visual skills that you're applying. And I can't really draw until I can do all the rest of that stuff. Right. And, and, and grip is, is one of the ones that is right. It's, it's very visible as an instructor because you see someone that grips the gun 30 different ways over the course of 30 different draws that that's going to be a problem for them over the long run. Right. Um, and it's, it's going to impact their ability to perform. So anyway, uh, I'm jumping around here, going back to your question. So you pick the, whatever that skill is that's within the parameters of, of what, you think reasonably somebody can learn in one day, right? Which is going to conform with the limitations of their short-term memory. And the first thing you're going to do in the morning after you get through your basic safety stuff, right? And kind of, you know, the, the components of what's going to make the day safe is you're going to teach them that and what is actually going to be priming. And I think you got this question for me later, Rich. So sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm jumping the gun here. Well, and, and honestly, that was kind of my fear and even asking that question because it, it really unpacks, a lot of what we're going to talk about. So right. let's, let's pause on priming because I, I want to, I want that to be a standalone okay. discussion. Okay. I think, I think your point though, Dusty is we have to understand the, the uh, brain's architecture in order to understand how we're going to train. Correct. And so I, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me finish Tony's question. Then we'll, we'll yeah. dive off, I don't want to leave him hanging. Yeah. yeah. So you're, so you're going to teach that limited amount. Um, you get a prime at first because I know you've read Building Shoes. You're going to prime at first. You go take a break, right? Let let the students' brain absorb that. Come back and reteach it, right? You're going to have to go off and teach other things, right, in that one day class. But frame it for the student as I'm presenting this to you. You're not going to learn it. Here's what you're going to learn today. I'm going to give you a familiarization on this other stuff so you've seen it and you know what right looks like and you know what wrongs look like because you've seen it before, but all I'm doing is, is presenting it to you as information. And then you keep coming back and reteaching and repracticing that core component you want them to learn. And that happens throughout the day. And like I said, hit me up privately and we can do more detail. So sorry. No, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Lance is on, says good morning. Guile in the Philippines is on, says good morning, Rich Brown and Dusty S everybody else. Greg Gomez from, uh, let's see, Greg is out in Texas. Good morning, Greg. He's coin number 2060. Manhar, good morning, sir. He's out there in South Africa. He says, hello, fellow warriors. Lance is on. This is great information. Steve Washington, good morning, sir. He says, good morning, gentlemen. Coin number 2003 from Michigan. Jared Clark, good morning, gentlemen. And Tony says, I will definitely PM or follow up with an email. Please hit that uh, share button, folks. I want to ask you also, like, uh, you know, you've written a lot of books and I need to get your new one on hitting, but is there a way that these books should be that digested? Like this is where I would want you to start. And then this is the way that you should progress. Yeah, that's a real good question. So um, I'll, I'll just run through what, what's in the books, right? So building shooters is a terrain map of the brain. Um, it can be applied to any subject matter. Obviously my background and interest is like farms and tactical stuff, but it's just a terrain map of how the brain learns. Mentoring shooters is how to take that and apply it, particularly dealing with, with entry-level students. And that includes a sample curriculum and outline form, and then very detailed a very detailed curriculum on how to deliver it to a student, which goes to just loading and unloading the gun, basically. Um, and then there's some student interaction stuff in there as well. Um, on training volume one is sort of a 30,000 foot view of the, the, the issues in the training industry. Um, on training volume two gets more into some nitty gritty instructor stuff. Um, uh, like dealing with remedial students. Um, the, there's a segment on the civilian industry that talks about aggressive stabilization. Heading in combat was a side project that came and grew out, kind of grew out of some other research and it takes on the aiming controversy. 
um, really from a, from a, a training standpoint. Uh, Becoming Shooters is another one of the new ones, and that is uh, also kind of a standalone side project that is basically aimed at, at brand new people, right? New gun owners or people that are curious about it. Uh, so it's like building shooters for people that, that are unfamiliar with guns. Um, and then Neuro is another one of the new ones, and that is the basis of design for the new system that we're building. Um, and then it gives a real, real detailed analysis of tactical training from the concept of how the brain works and how we learn. You said the aiming controversy, Dusty. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about what are you, what are you referring to? Yeah, so uh, kind of one of those um, one of those arguments that you'll you'll hear, right? Like the the lose friendships and kind of argument sometimes is uh, uh, point shooting versus aim fire. Um, and so, as I was researching some other stuff, I came across a bunch of information. Um, which again, it wasn't what I was researching specifically that I thought was very relevant to that discussion specifically related to um, the impacts of how we train on how we perform, right? And what those impacts can be long-term. Um, and so that's specifically what that's, that book's about. Um, I don't, uh, I actually endorse both, uh, both point shooting and aim fire in the book. Um, I think they're both important for, for different reasons, obviously, uh, but how we train can have a big impact on how we perform and that's, um, and what our potential can be. So that's, that's what that book's about. And I don't, I don't remember, uh, I, I think there's a law that incorporates this and I, I don't remember where I heard it. Um, but this idea of fire together, wire together, you know, when yes. we talk about neuroscience and, uh, I think that when we teach our firearms instructor development course, you know, one of the things I try to get them to understand is this is a key concept that you really need to understand. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, 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 the law is called Hebb's law, right? As a neuroscientist, I think back in the forties that proposed, um, that, you know, effectively the more that we do something, the better we're going to get at it. Um, and there's, there are some, this has been proven out, right? There are reasons that this happens. Um, I know my, Mike likes to talk a lot about uh, myelination. Myelination is something that's, it's actually really, really complex. I know I'd written some stuff about it and uh, I got some, uh, um, <laughs> I got some well-deserved uh, smack in the back of the head from some people and really had to dive down into the neuroscience of how this works. Uh, so, understand that what I'm going to say now is not technically accurate, right? There's a totally different method of how the brain transmits signals than you would have in an electrical circuit, even though it is, it is elect, it is charges in the brain, right? But yeah. it's a different method. It's called saltatory conduction in the brain and it's, it's different, but you, you can understand the, the basic concept, even though it is not technically accurate by thinking of, um, if I have two neurons and they send a signal back and forth, um, the brain will recognize that's important and it'll, you know, either be using a bare wire or it'll, you know, potentially put a wire there, um, right, to, to send the signal. And the more that you send this back and forth, the brain wants to make that signal efficient because the brain wants to be energy efficient, right? If it's doing something repetitively, your, your brain is fundamentally, I, lazy is, is a term, but basically it wants to survive, right? And so, the less energy it can spend, the more energy it has available for the emergency scenario, right? Or to last longer if you didn't have calories coming in. And so the more energy efficient it can be, the more it is adapting for survival. So it takes this circuit and it wraps it among other things, right? There's many other things in this process, but it does wrap it with an insulation called myelin, right? The, the axons get wrapped with this insulative uh, material, um, which increases the signal strength, right? Makes it more efficient. Um, and it also makes that signal strength faster, right? And so when this happens, you basically get a, a, a dedicated circuit because you've had these physical structural changes that have happened across the circuitry, right? And there's other stuff that happens in the synapses and that gets into really complex chemistry and some quantum mechanics and stuff I can't even begin to talk about, right? But so the, the, the circuits will get specialized. And so the more that you do something, you're, you're literally physically wiring together things in the brain, right? So I describe it as you're actually building for anybody that's really into the tech world, you're actually building firmware, not embedded software, right? You're actually building circuitry in the brain 
when you train, right? And so it, it, there's a there's a flip side of Hebb's law, which is incredibly important, also, which is not only uh, fire together, wire together, but fire apart. You also wire apart, mm-hmm. right? Because insulation is a two way street, and and that's an incredibly powerful concept to understand as well. And also to your point about uh, you know the the brain accounts for like 2% of your body mass, but it accounts for like 20% of your caloric intake or uh, yes. that's what I've heard. Expenditure, yeah. Yeah. The, and, and if you look at like chess masters playing a chess game, they're burning calories that they're, they're well exceeding that 20% of oh, yeah. calories from the brain. They're, they're crushing it. And I took a, a, a I did a little meditative thing oh. called like uh, the Einstein method or something like that, where, you want to get parts of your brain that have never spoke together to fire and wire together to access more of your brain. And he had this, the professor that put it together had a, had a technique to that. But I think we need to understand this as trainers at a deep level, maybe not at a super deep level, but just some of the basics like Hebb's law, I think is pretty doggone important to understand that myelination is a thing. And once something, please talk to this, if you could Dusty, that once a, neural pathways have been myelinated. It can't be unmyelinated as I understand it. You have to create a stronger path. So for example, if I learn the old Danny Glover shooting style and that's well myelinated in order to understand how to correctly hold the firearm, I'm going to have to myelinate a new path and that path has to be stronger to override the other circuit. Or that's the way I've heard it. Is that completely bunk? It, no, it's not completely bunk. I mean, like I said, the, um, Actual neuroscientists would probably quibble with uh, how the myelination is, is getting applied there, but it is a good way to think about it. Um, and so understand that there's there are different memory systems, right? Like, again, like I said before, things that you learn, there's the declarative memory and then there's procedural memory. Um, and so one of the things that is very challenging um in this field that, that we're in, right, is that everything the student, and, and I'm talking about defensive shooting now in, in right. particular, right, where, uh, or, or combat or defensive combative, whatever. Um, if you're ever using the skills, you're doing it under this altered brain state, right? And so just because I can go do something um, specifically on the, uh, um, specifically on the range when I'm concentrating on it and even do it very well, that doesn't mean that's what's going to happen in the real world. Right. And so one of the most visceral uh, examples of this I ever saw, and, and it was really at the point where I, I, I recognized the deficiency in how I was teaching people, right. Like mechanically um, was I had a student who had gotten through, right. Very good on the range, very good with dry fire, and I, I, I took her and I put her into, it was the, at the end of our level one class, um, was this very basic um, uh, knife charge scenario. I wouldn't even call it scenario, right? It was like, I am going to start here and I'm going to charge you with a knife. You are going to draw the gun when I start walking and, and shoot me, right? Just kind of stepping into having somebody that you're dealing with. This is with, with Airsoft, obviously. And... Um, she reverted to like this, like second grade schoolyard skill performance, right? And this isn't really even a stressful scenario, but I realize I, you're going to ask me about this later. I realized the power of the context there, right? Because it was just blatantly obvious. I'm like, we have spent weeks working on this other stuff, which you're highly skilled at. And that's not what happened when all of a sudden you got exposed to this different context. And there's kind of this little bit of, of, uh, I wouldn't, I mean, this little bit of stress, right? There's some stressors involved here. Um, and all of a sudden you access something that was completely different than what we built, right? And so uh, understanding that in this field where we're, we're trying to teach people to perform, we can teach them things that will not happen under stress, right? Because there's something else that's there that is, you know, when I'm an e- either contextualized or dominant, to what they've learned, even though they can perform it. And so as instructors, right, this is something that's, it's worthwhile knowing and it's important to understand why you don't want to screw the student up, right? Or or, or rush past development of the fundamentals um, in such a way that 
they never get them put in place where they're accessible and, and under the stress response. Well, that kind of leads to the, my next question. You know, what is, when we're trying to uh, help our students make better decisions contextually yeah. and we want them to make decisions at speed because, you know, everybody on here has heard of the OODA loop and we all understand right. how ho hopefully we get it. Some people misunderstand it, but that's, that's okay. Uh, and if you haven't read, uh, I think it's names Coram's book on Boyd, John Boyd to understand the OODA loop is a phenomenal book, but uh, tell us, tell us the role in neuroscience's answer to making better decisions at speed. If you could, that's yeah, so it, it, again, like ne neuroscience is just the study of how the brain works, right? I'm obviously not a neuroscientist. If anybody got confused in that discussion, um, the uh, um, so if we understand how the brain works, we're gonna understand how to manipulate it better as trainers. We're gonna understand how to manipulate the brain to get the outcomes we want, right? That's kind of my my hook into it. Um, so specifically on the decision making side right we tend to make we have an easier time making decisions when it's something that we've experienced before right and we have relevant context to it so that is one of the jobs of a of a trainer right in at the appropriate time you can't do all of this in one day or at the appropriate time to have the student have relevant context to the decisions that they might have to make so they've seen it before they've experienced it and they can now make these kinds of decisions, right? It's also important um, for people to have a framework, right? I tend to lean towards principles rather than if then statements, right? And understanding what, what your priorities are. Um, and again, like that kind of give the, gives the brain, like in, in the military, we call it priorities of work, right? And that's still kind of the terminology I use um, where it, it allows us to make decisions a lot easier because we have already processed the relevant information or at least it helps our brain process the relevant information because it, it, it it's already told it how that it how that it, it's supposed to work right so so here, here's an example I'll give is my background operationally is a protective operations guy right after getting out of the navy so imagine that you are really simply sitting with your principal right you're, you're taking your principal and his family to the mall right it's a civilian gig he's got a business meeting his wife and kids are going to the mall to go you know shop so you're the only protective guy right you take his wife and kids you drop them off at the mall and then you and him drive over and you're sitting in a restaurant that's across the street right and all of a sudden there's something bad security wise a shooting or something is going on at the mall what do you do right so if you already know right as a protective operations guy right maybe you actually don't work for him you work for his company and he is your principal right you are grabbing him you are evacuating him and you're taking off because you want to get him away from what the threat is on the flip side of that if he is your boss and he has told you prior okay yeah you're here to protect me right but my priority is protecting my three-year-old child right my wife would be next to that and then i'm last right so you're leaving him and you're running into the mall to go get his kid Right. And you don't have to, I mean, you're making that decision, but you don't have to sit and process that information because you've already established that priority. Right. And so as instructors, we can help people. We can't necessarily give them that framework, but we can help them understand that they need to make that framework um, for themselves. Right. And again, that just kind of aligns with fundamentally how we work and how we learn and cutting out those really time consuming components of the OODA loop of orientation and decision because that stuff's pre-made and priorities can help you do that. Um, did that answer the question or did I squirrel off and the, no, I think that answers it there. You know, we, we talked a lot about this with other guests, Dusty, and that is that, you know, I've got these lines in the sand or whatever metaphor you want to use as far as like, I'm not going to think about it. If somebody does this, you know, I, I'm going to respond in a certain way. And that cuts right. down all the processing speed in my head. Yes. So if you draw a handgun, I'm not, we're not having a conversation, you know, you're going to be shot. Right. Uh, and I think there's a lot of really good stuff in this, but I, I, I think we'll come to more of that when we talk about priming later. But what is sleep's role in all this? Is, is sleep overrated or underrated? Yeah, really good question. So um, 
sleep is incredibly important for learning. I mean, there, there's kind of like the health benefits and all that, right? Like if you're, if you're, if you're sleep deprived, you're going to be cognitively impaired. Your brain's going to be working slower. Uh, but sleep does some really, really interesting things, right? So you sleep and, and specifically when you go in the REM state, it kind of basically goes through and wipes away the BS, right? It's almost got like an eraser thing where it, it pulls out all of the clutter and it will also help your brain form novel connections. So there's, there is a lot to like, let me sleep on that because your yep. brain actually will form novel connections and do the analysis while you're sleeping. So that's one thing. A second component, which is incredibly important for learning, is that there are components of, of both stabilization and consolidation, right? Particularly consolidation where your brain is taking that information and transferring into long-term memory. They cannot happen while you're awake, right? So you cannot, your student cannot learn. They cannot take the information and put it in the long-term memory if they haven't had the opportunity to sleep, right? And so when we look at those, um, you know, again, kind of getting into that that brain-based training methodology, right? Giving somebody uh, the, the limitations of what they're able to get into that short-term memory system, giving them the opportunity to rest so that brain, the, the brain can stabilize the information and then sleep so it can put it in long-term memory and uh, really reduce the ability of that thing to get... Um, or that, that piece of information to get corrupted is really, really important. Sleep is, is sleep cycles are so important in training, incredibly important. Yeah, totally agree with that. Uh, Will says, good morning, running late this morning. We're just happy you're here, Will. Dr. T.C. Fuller is on. He says, good morning, gentlemen from South Carolina, coin number 1620. Please, let's take a quick share break. Hit that share button. Put this into a group that needs this information because what we're talking about this morning with Dusty Solomon from Building Shooters is the neuroscience of learning, specifically for us in the firearms industry, the neuroscience of building shooters, which is his company. We talked about sleep's role in learning. Um, how does, I want to talk about, I want to ask your opinion on what makes a great coach or specifically a great firearms instructor. Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I, I thought about this and I wrote down three words in response, right? Because I got, the, I got these questions ahead of time. Producing student results. That would be, I think um, there's a lot of different reasons that, that people go to training, right? Um, and I don't know, I mean, you guys see a lot more of this than I do. I think a lot of folks, at least in my experience, and I, I, I didn't make this up as a, a, a guy I worked with overseas who spent a lot of time uh, teaching in, in the civilian world and then military stuff also worked for, he's a, a long range, a long range distance guy, um, a former Marine sniper. And his, his breakdown was that, you know, people value experience and entertainment way before they value education and learning. Um, you, you know, and, and that's, it, it, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, right? Like by, by any means, that, that's just how it is. And a lot of that has, um, I, I guess it would be an interesting philosophical discussion to sit around and have some time, right, over some beverages on how much sort of the, the assumptions and limitations of training drove that or how much you know kind of drove that development in the market or how much that drove the development of training i don't know um you know a question for the philosophers i guess um but we have the, the, there are a number of folks who put out just fantastic information incredibly highly skilled people put out really really good information um in ways that the market expects it don't necessarily help people learn um and, and, and again, that, that's no, no hit on that particular person, right? Because there are just limitations in how, in how training is structured. Um, but, but to me, I think what makes, a, what makes a great coach or an instructor is producing results at the end of the day with students. And I, I wrote a, it was an article, and I can't, I actually don't know if this is in one of the books or not. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was kind of along the lines of like, or, or, or part of the article was, this whole idea of like, just if you're an instructor, you don't have to have been, you know, super ninja, whatever, right? Like just be who you are and teach stuff that you know, and that you're good at and that's relevant. And, you know, I, anybody who is really, really good at something, or right? I can tell you this as someone with no special operations background or whatever, if you have something to offer people who are really, really good at stuff are going to want to pick up what you have to offer because that is why they're really, really good. Right. Anybody who is really, really, really good at something at a certain point completely puts their ego aside and sits down and wants to learn something that they don't know. And that's why they're as good as they are. Right. So I guess that'd be my 
my advice. I don't know if I answered that question either, but no, perfect. Okay. Uh, Greg makes a point here. Says Seal Mindset developed a number of video courses. Can you give some insight into the effectiveness between online versus one or two day in person training? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, uh, I and I think this is going to tie into a question you're going to ask me later, yeah. uh, which is why I didn't didn't want to jump in on that. So, I think the future of where this is going to go. Um, in terms of on, on both the professional side and on the, on the civilian side is going to be a very hybrid sort of delivery. I know that, uh, and you can, Rich, you can speak this more than I can. I know Mike was doing some of that during COVID and apparently very, very good results yeah. um, with some of that, uh, that, that interactive online stuff. So the challenge in the one to two day in-person training is that you're forced into a structure that is incompatible with how your brain receives and learns. Right. I mean, the, the, that's just the unfortunate reality. Right. Now, th yeah. yeah, like now there are things that you can get in those. Um, right. So you can't sit there and feel Mike come up and wrap his hand around yours and realize you've been under gripping the gun for the last 20 years. Right. Like I, like I got at the uh, <laughs> um, uh, when I went to uh, him and, and Rob Latham's class a couple of years ago. It's like, wow, I've been doing this wrong for a long time. <laughs> that's that's good to know. Yeah. Um Right. So you you can't get that in an online environment or an online format. But what you can get is you can get the information delivered to you in chunks that match the way your, your brain receives information. So I think the, the future of this is going to be uh, kind of some strong version of hybrid where we can figure out. And I, I couldn't pretend to know the answer to this right now. We will know here are the, here's the stuff we don't do a good job imparting via online. And so we have to physically be with the student to get this across to them. And then this is stuff that we're able to do very effectively in an interactive format um, to kind of optimize it. But that would be what I'd tell you is the difference, right? The downside is you're not getting feedback when you're doing something like the, like that online video. Right. Um, but, but I can tell you like the, the, the seal mindset, like I think there's the, I think Mike Mike Ostner is still selling these, the like the 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 hanga the concealed mass concealed carry like master's course stuff, and then the defensive rifle. Right, that was all structured basically out of what our level one course was. They took a lot of the stuff that we didn't, you know. This is after I left the company. I know they took some stuff we talked about not wanting to make public and took that out of it, um, or make it, you know, like it open source, I guess, right? Where there wasn't an instructor filter, but um, it was basically align with what we saw worked with students in these bite-sized chunks and what people would pick up. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, right? But you, you're going to get less feedback, obviously, if you're just doing a video, but you can get the information delivered to you in the same way that your brain receives information. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, when Mike started putting those online defensive handgun training programs uh, during COVID, when he couldn't travel, the feedback was incredible. Like yeah. I said, yeah, you missed some of it, but uh, the the fact that it works with the way your brain processes information is probably better in the long term. Yeah, but Jeff asked a good question, and I, I Jeff, I, I love you, but I'm I'm going to hold off on that question because I think it comes in later. Hopefully, we'll answer it. If not, please ask it again because it's a great question. Uh, he's asking here about training repetition versus scenario based. I, I want to get to that later, but TC says we've come a long way in terms of delivering distance education in the last 10 to 15 years, but better does not mean perfect. We can still improve. And, uh, and Dusty gives us a thumbs up on that one. Of course, absolutely. TC has a doctorate in education, so he knows a little bit about that. Yes. In your opinion, Dusty, what is wrong with the, the 40 hours SME or subject matter expert? And well, for the, people that don't understand that yeah. model, can you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so the, the you tell me if I'm getting the question wrong here. So the 40-hour subject matter expert is we're going to send you to a class, right? And we have and, – and I mean, I, I will tell you I got a much more visceral understanding of this when I went – like I, I work, you know, I'm, I'm basically self-funding my training system development habits right now, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm working in another field um, – in a, a, a rotational job where half the time I'm working in the oil field. And so I've got, um, I, I had to go learn a completely new skill, right? Or a completely new skill set that I knew nothing about. And so I ended up going to a bunch of these 40 hour classes where I'm now expected to go learn. Right. And it's like, I go to a 40 hour class and walk out with 
about seven minutes worth of information at the end of the 40 hours, right? And maybe retain even less than that, right? If we, if we talk a couple months later. And so having done that in a totally different field, right? That is the problem with the 40 hour subject matter expert. And that's not to say like, and, and I, I truly mean this, that's not to say that there are not times and places and applications where a, a solid, you know, two or three day class or a 40 hour a uh, dedicated learning class cannot be valuable, but those classes are not that valuable for brand new learners, right? If you take, so for example, if you take like me and Rich and, and TC and you send us to, um, yeah, <laughs> very cool binder, very yeah. cool binder. I got a very cool binder and a lot, lot of graphics. Yeah. Um, uh, if you take the three of us and send us to, hey, we're going to do, whatever, 40 hours of room entries, right? At the end of that, like, all of us have done room entries for a living at some point in our lives, right? All of us have done a lot of shooting, right? Like, and so, you, you know, by the end of that 40 hours, we're, we are working mostly in the long-term memory system directly, right, at that point, because we built this framework. It's almost like we've built the library, we have all the shelves, the Dewey Decimal System is in place. And so we get a new piece of information, and we have a shelf to put that on and something to associate it with. Whereas if you're a brand new learner, right, and you're like, I'm going to go take a 40-hour CQB class. Like, I mean, I'll tell you, if that's in your mind, like, A, the instructor shouldn't let you, particularly if it's if it's live fire, and you the instructor lets you and leave the class. <laughs> you don't want to be in there, um, but you're going to do so much damage to your overall skill set and your long term potential, right? Just because some of that stuff we talked about earlier, that you know, you, there's no way that you're going to walk out of there with much value, right? And so now if you're considered, I went to this 40 hour class, which was structured in a way where it was impossible for me to learn the information. And now I'm looked at as the subject matter expert, right? Who is now supposed to be teaching other people, right? That's just sort of this massive water down of information um, and expertise that is is not good for the industry. And it's not, it's certainly not good organizationally. I can tell you that. Well, and that's the problem, you know, is, is law enforcement community faces this this problem you know i need a, a a defensive tactics instructor i can send my guy i can i can afford to lose officer solomon for right. one week and he's going to come back and he's going to have this you know certificate to hang on the wall that says he is a krav maga instructor and he got this you know, 40 hours now he's going to do in-service training for us next year well next right. year he's not going to remember anything and and i think that's the danger in and it's where it's what the market wants. The market wants to, it does. It's a, it wants to have the 40 hour expert, but the problem is that doesn't sync up with the way we learn information. Yeah. So um, I guess what would it look like in a perfect world to, to, to make that SME? I mean, it, is there any way that it would fit into the paradigm that law enforcement even wants? Well, there, it, yeah, so I, I think there is, and I think this leads us back into um, the value, like when we look at the long term and the TC's point, right, like, and look, everybody here has sat through, I would say almost everybody here has sat through a class, right, you've gone, you've done like, uh, whatever, right, some online learning, right, you're on your phone, right, because it's whatever, right, like participation only, right, you have to get through the 90 slides that are going to run, right, and uh, yes, Tony Falsi, a train the trainer. There you go. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, and at the end of it, you don't remember anything. You couldn't even five minutes later, you couldn't even barely say what, what class you just did. Right. You just know you've completed your GMT training or whatever. Um, and, and you're not getting much out of that. So I, I think there's a lot of people look at, as soon as you mention that you're going to do this hybrid, hybrid online thing, right? like I know the NRA tried to do that right in a way that wasn't particularly effective. Right. But just because the medium is not used well, right. Or used effectively doesn't mean that it can't be used effectively because the one thing that that does do is it gives us the ability to send people information in a way that matches how they receive it and do it in a way that's scalable. Right. And everybody, if you don't understand what I mean by scalable, right. Like, you, you can link up with Rich or Mike, right? And they will teach you 15 minutes a day or 20 minutes a day in the way that your brain learns. But you're, it's going to cost you a lot of money to get Rich or Mike to do that, right? Like, I'm, I don't know what the, what the cost would be, but it's going to be a lot. Um, 
and and so because you know for them as instructors right they have to make a living right and so they would have to be able to teach an entire group of students that way right a lot of people that way to make it worth their time right and that was part of the the difficulty we had at sealed mindset taking this model and making it commercially viable um, was that the, the private instruction was very very expensive right and the getting people to come to groups right sort of uh you know you come in uh you, i think we gave them options you could come in like it was either tuesday or thursday for your class that week and it was I, I might have some i don't remember this is a long time ago some of the details wrong yeah like a morning and an afternoon option whatever people are like man this is a huge time suck out of my that I have to dedicate this in my schedule, and I, I, I know I'm not going to be able to fit that into my life, right? Um, the, the martial arts model did actually work, right? Where we they broke it down into kind of like belts, right? So you weren't necessarily getting information always in the right order, but it was in small enough groups for each belt that it didn't really matter over the long run, right? And they were still able to uh, basically apply the science and, and run very effective training. Um, so I, I feel like I've kind of gotten off, off track here a little bit, but... Uh, um, yeah, so in, in terms of a course of instruction that fits in the schedule, yes, we can do that. And, and I, I would say that for law enforcement and military, it's actually pretty easy because you own the people, you're already paying for their time, and you can tell them what to do when they're at work, right? So you can have people come in, right? Everybody, right, unless you've got some acute issue going on, right? Like there was a murder this morning and it's all hands on deck because we got to go find a lost child kind of thing, right? Like, but everybody has, like, let, let's be honest, every police officer has 20 to 30 minutes of downtime in their day, right? Like those kind of, you know, issues aside, everybody has downtime in their day. And so it's a matter of using, uh, this is part of our big focus of building shooters, right? Like how do we develop tools and methods for low resource environments where you don't have to drive three hours out to the range, need to have the instructor and the ammo of all that. How can we do things that are very effective in low resource settings that allow us to deliver training in a way that the brain learns? So that's a roundabout way. So absolutely it's possible to have a course in instruction. It can't be done with nothing. We can do a lot with a little. We can't do much with nothing. And it does require a fundamental restructuring of the entire concept yeah. of how we're going to deliver training. And, and that's exactly the, that's the Cliff Notes version. It's going to require a restructuring of the way we do training because we've been, if we're trying to work on this little gray matter between our ears, we need to do it differently. Jesse asked a great question, Dustin. Yeah. This is, can you remember the greatest piece of advice you have received as a new instructor? I, you know, I, I saw that and I didn't jump in on it because I'm I'm kind of drawing a drawing a blank as I look back, right? Like so I did not I did not go into and I guess this is interesting, and this is actually probably what has given me so much passion about this um, is that I was in a very, very unique position as an instructor where I was not a billeted instructor. I was never a billeted instructor, right? I never went to a command as, uh, hey, you're the, I mean, I was a, I was a junior officer, right? Who's going to take an ensign and be like, you're the fire instructor? No, right? Like everybody else has been in the military. You're, you're, your own one is not the guy you're going to. Like, that's my technical expert, right? Like how often is that? No, that, that, that doesn't happen. Um, so I was never there where somebody was like, you're an instructor and I'm going to mentor you to be the instructor. I was there with unique knowledge and a skill set that I really shouldn't have had, but, but I, but I did because I was on a shooting team at school and had some amazing, you know, coaches and mentors there. Right. So I, I was standing in a, in a place where it, it was sort of like watching the train wreck very slowly. Right. I mean, like, wow, this is this is horrible. Right. Like, wait, <laughs> like, so it's like on the ship, right? kind of the first time I really jumped in and grabbed the bull by the horns with this to, to teach people was on the ship when the Navy came down and said, everybody is going to load the guns August. Whatever, I think it was August. Right. Whatever it is. Right. And this is in like May. And I'm like, OK, well, it. You know, because up to that point, right, like the goal, the qualification process was somebody hand, a gunner's may handed you a loaded gun, you shot five rounds into the ocean, and that was it. There's no targets, right? You're shooting five rounds off the fantail. That was kind of the accepted standard in the surface fleet. And to go from that to we're going to have 18-year-olds swapping a, a, a loaded gun out 
by themselves right up on the quarter deck or up on the you know whatever putting rounds in and out of the chamber and like i mean i know what this looks like right i mean i did weapons detail at the academy and you know you're just running the call course and i've been around guns long enough to know this is going to be a train wreck disaster which it was right um you know navy wide and uh and I was in a position to do something about it because I knew how to load, no, load, both load and unload again, and I knew how to run a range from being on that shooting team. So it's not; it, it was never a situation where I was there as an instructor. I was there as an instructor, sort of out of necessity and out of passion, because I was operationally responsible for the guys, right? And I was standing security watches with them, right? It wasn't like I was in some off in some billeted training role. I was going to be responding to a security threat with these guys. I was going to be doing a boarding with the boarding team. Um, and I was also the guy who was administratively responsible for it. So I basically had three roles at the same time, right? The instructor role, which I, I assumed because really through no skill or fault of my own, right? I just happened to be the subject matter expert because of some other people being very skilled. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and then was also the operational supervisor and the guy that was going to be standing next to these guys if they actually needed to use a gun, right? So filling all three of those roles at the same time um, kind of put me on this, I guess, this path that I'm on. That was kind of probably a crap. Uh, send a message and say I'm an idiot, Jesse, if that was the wrong answer to your question. So I guess my advice to any instructor would be just understand how the brain learns and try to deliver information that way and do no harm to the student. Right, like I try to take a very, and I, I preach this a lot in the books. Right, a very Hippocratic approach to training. Understand what you're, understand what you're doing to the student with the interaction, the training method, and don't hurt them. Right, or don't impede their long-term performance potential. Yeah, and Gregory is on this morning. Good morning, Gregory. Looking forward to having you on the show. He says, "Good morning, all." Coin number nineteen twenty-eight from Rhode Island. Uh, Doctor Fuller says, "I have long found it interesting that when you want to learn pretty much any other." sports slash skill you see the market support long-term repetitive training look at bjj classes for example yet when it comes to firearms training the market default is quick hit day long uh classes then back to the range alone again and the educational literature is very clear that this uh, is a very ineffective way to train skills into long-term memory which is weird and i'll let's take bjj uh to dr fuller's point because i think this is a great segue between yeah. my, for my next question and that is providing context. So yep. for, for example, I have two, I take two different BJJ classes. I take one from uh, instructor Cody Hudson, who's a, a federal law enforcement officer, and it is a, a military and law enforcement class only. So the training we get is placed into context. Right. And then I have another instructor uh, that I train with, and Lance is a 10th Planet Jiu Jitsu, Eddie Bravo, you know, everybody smells like weed and we play <laughs> electronic music and we roll around and stuff and it's all nogi. And I say that because in the 10th planet system, there's some effective stuff, you know, like the, the truck and they have some really crazy names, the twister. But I was telling my son, cause he trains only 10th planet. I said, you know, Grant, the problem with these is the contextual application of this. If you are having to subdue someone putting them in a truck or a twister well, the truck, for example, those that don't know 10th planet don't know what I'm talking about, but I have control of the legs. It's a very painful position, but the, the suspect's arms are free. And I use the term right. suspect, the person I'm fighting. So they are, they have freedom of movement with their hands to, to grab a weapon or do what they want and may not care that you have them in a painful calf slicer position. So right. I, I give this long diatribe to have you explain to us, the purpose of contextualized training. Yeah. Um, can, can I jump in and hit what TC said again real Please, quick? Do and, so. And that. so, so TC and, and, and hit back if you don't agree with this or you have more context. Um, so I think there's a couple things that go into that. So one is there's this assumption that we got to be in the high resource environment, right? If we're going to shoot, we have to have ammo and we have to be on a range, right? So that's, that's one piece. And then a second piece is that this is particularly in the professional settings. For some reason, we've got this assumption that if I'm going to be a firearms instructor, I have to be a billeted trainer and we treat it as a specialized skill set. And, and I don't disagree with that. The teaching is a specialized skill set, but I also, 
you know, and I guess I'm just musing here, right? We don't really do that with anything else in the in the professional world, right? You go out and you're you're mentored, right, by your field training officer or whatever to perform all these skills that are necessary on the job. But when it comes to the arm part of that, we go, oh no, only this specific guy that can teach it. Like I know with the State Department, right, you couldn't even teach. Even if you were a certified firearms instructor with the State Department, unless you were filling the billet, right, they would not let you be the guy who was actually teaching or running classes. Like, it was really weird. We've got just sort of this very liability-driven, structured, like, I want to control everything. Uh, and, and I understand, right? I mean, liability is a real thing, right? Like, it's not something to poo-poo. Like, it, it, it's legit. It's a, real, it's a real thing. But I don't think over the long run that helps us. I think... Uh, understanding that we can train very effectively in low resource environments and, and, and pushing that instructor role, like, cause, cause this, this makes the delivery more scalable. Um, yeah, no, TCI, I agree. Like uh, institutional and speak with one voice, um, completely agreed. I mean, uh, th th those are definitely big components of it. I think if there's a way we can do that, we're basically part of becoming a supervisor, right? Even that lower level supervisors having those skills and understanding that and being able to uh, deliver stuff to people and run drills in the way that they learn. I think there's a lot of benefits there. Um, so I'll, I'll, sorry, Rich, I'll go back to your question. So we could, TC and I could go back on that for hours probably. Um, so uh, context and adult learning. Yeah, so context is is really, really important. So I'll give an abstract, but real an anecdotal abstract example, right? So uh, a guy I used to work with overseas, um, as soon as he got in a scenario, right, like either either in training, right, like pre-deployment training, or he got overseas, he's throwing in Copenhagen, right? Like, and basically for him, if he had a rifle in his hand, he had something in his lip. But as soon as he went home, he had no cravings at all. Right. So, if, I mean, and think about that, right, from the, the, the addiction level of nicotine, for him, that addiction was contextualized to have an, an M4 in his hand. Right. So that, that just kind of gives you a window into what the power of context can be. Right. And um, uh, the, so so here's another one. Right. So and there's a, this examples in the book, Hitting in Combat. So I'm in. Uh, was the NRA patrol rifle and like NRA law enforcement patrol rifle instructor class or something. I was still filling an operational role at the time and they're doing this drill, which is okay. You got, it was this drill for a student who has basically never fired around before, right? like day one, week one guy. Um, and uh, uh, Greg, good question. I'm going to come back to that. Um, so, uh, um, and I, I shouldn't have done that because now my, my uh, train of thoughts all screwed up. Right. So I'm standing there and it's just the, the drill is literally got like one round in the gun. You press the trigger, you hold the trigger to the rear until the instructor tells you, right? Like, okay, now release it. And it's just to understand that the trigger resets. That's it. Right. It's only something you do one time. It's just to understand that the trigger resets. That's the purpose of this drill that we're doing. And um, I couldn't do it. I could not hold the trigger back. Right, because we're, you know, whatever, we're just far enough away because we're with, with rifle, right? So you don't want the muzzle blast ripping your targets apart. We're just far enough away from the the target that, uh, you know, whatever. So we're in like a close quarters thing. I cannot make my finger hold the trigger to the rear, right? And so my, the, my buddy's looking at me because obviously I'm not, I'm not a new shooter, right? Like I know how to shoot, I can handle the gun and all that. And he's like, all right, so just like press the trigger and, and just hold it to the rear. And I couldn't do it, right? And he's just like, the instructors come over and they're like, and I'm like, I, I don't know what's going on. Like, I can't control the figure. Like, I can't make it do that. And he's just, my buddy's, or the, you know, the guy that's with me, my partner is just like, well, that's a well-trained finger, you know? So about 20 minutes later, right? Or maybe a half hour later, we're, we're zeroing, right? Because now they're going through like different methods of zeroing, right? So we're in the prone position at 25 yards. Everything's completely administrative, right? And so now I'm in this like target shooting context, right? Which has nothing to do with, with combat or with fighting, right? Where I'm doing this like very slow press, very slow. Press. So I'm now doing the drill that I could not make myself do uh, 30 minutes earlier. Right. And again, that kind of shows you that power of context where I contextualize where I was in and 
even though it's this administrative thing of being this close quarters combat, and I couldn't make my finger do something that wasn't relevant to that context. Um, so, yeah, so that, that I, I, hopefully those two examples give, you know, particularly the shooting one, an example of, or, or an indication into how important context can be with adult learning and how important context can be in training um, and why it's important as far as uh, how you develop people's skills, right? And this stuff can be very important operationally too. Oh, like, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you know, doing absolutely the most brilliant skill in the wrong place at the wrong time can be a disaster. Let's talk about that. Let's take it there. Uh, okay. So, yeah. You know, I, I want you to talk about um, – Associative judgment and as it relates to associative uh, skill performance, I think those are your terms. Uh, yeah, so um, I think if I can come up with a, with a real good example here. Right, well, so again, so, so, so here's an abstract one, right? So this is, it was our first instructor development class with SEAL Mindset, right? We were taking a bunch of guys from the local community. They were all, our first group of instructors were all, you know, 20 plus year law enforcement guys, right, um, who were instructors. So we put them through this instructor development class and then they were going to, you know, go out and teach, right? That was kind of the, the concept of the business model. And so I got this guy in there. He's been a law enforcement instructor for 30 something years, right? And he's up on the line and we're doing this uh, drill, which was you're going to respond to a, a, a visual stimulus, right? Which at the time I was just using a flashlight. We're at an indoor range, I got a tactical flashlight. When I light the target up, it's a threat. Right. When the light goes away, the threat has gone away. Right. So and I'm like, but I want to get your shooting performance. Right. I want to get your shot splits. Right. So we can measure your shooting performance. So um, don't respond when you hear the buzzer. I'm just going to reset the shot timer so we can get your splits. Right. Like he's like, OK, Roger that. I hit the buzzer on the shot timer. He draws and fires two rounds in the target and reholsters. I kind of look up at him. He looks at me like uh, so he starts laughing. Right. I'm laughing. Right? He's kind of like, OK. You understand what we're doing? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. So don't respond to the buzzer. Yeah, I got it. I hit the buzzer. He draws again, fires two rounds in the target, right? Because that association of that stimulus was so respond, you know, was so associated with him drawing and firing two rounds because he's been doing it for however long, right? Um, and so we do get these associations where we associate specific stimuli or specific contests with specific actions and and again like operationally those things can go really really bad right um so and, and this can also translate out of skills and even into decision making right where i will take uh, like, like we like to talk about lessons learned right but you take lessons learned out of the wrong operational environment and put in a different one right and it can be really really harmful so i'll give i'm gonna talk yeah so so i'll, I'll give one example right so this is in Iraq, right? So guys took a lesson out of one environment where the cops were bad guys, right? Because like, Iraq was very disparate for people that didn't work there, right? Like some places in Iraq were kind of like going to Wisconsin. Other places, not like Wisconsin at all, right? <laughs> um, so, so, so it took lessons from a place where um, something was 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 kind of like Wisconsin, right? And the guys freaked out and ran from the cops and it turned into like basically a blue on blue um, and took that to a place that was very much not like Wisconsin, right? And said, wow, I got to listen to what the cops say, right? And then that went really bad, right? So it was like, I've, I've got the right lesson in the wrong context and applied it, right? And so um, I guess there's just, you know, I'm sure TC's probably got a, a lot to throw in on this as well, right? Like, um, understanding the environment, the environment that you're in and how, what you're doing applies to that is really, really important. And it's important to understand that in training. And if your students don't understand it, which they, they may not, cause you're the instructor, it's very helpful for you to frame that context for them. Like here is how this skill applies in a one environment, right? Or here's how, like, like I want to frame a mental picture for you for what you're doing, not just doing a discrete skill practice. Well, the thing that I always think of when I think of this uh, associative skill performance as being a, a problem is, and we see this on the range training law enforcement officers, where for a long time it was really in vogue to anytime you're doing a mag change, you're stepping aggressively offline. And then when you're teaching 
cops and some are doing that from one agency and not another one or one shooter's left hand, one's right hand, and they're bumping into each other. The potential for a muzzle, you know, for one person to muzzle somebody else because they're doing this step and trying to break them of that habit. Like, dude, what if you're, what if you're already behind cover? Oh, and I can't, I can't give you one for this. Cause I, I mean, that, that was the thing, right? Like for a while, that was the training. That was the thing. I did, yeah. I, I did that in CQB and stepped in front of my buddy's muzzle. Oof. Yeah. You don't want to do that. Right. I was like, okay, there's no more automatic anything associated no. with this. Right. Like, yeah. wow. That was, fortunately it was Sims, right. That was bad. <laughs> I was like, and yeah, I, didn't know, I, I didn't know I did it till afterwards. Right. We're kind of doing this debrief and I'm, you know, like training environment. Right. I'm always like, Hey, uh, tell me what I've screwed up. And he's like, well, you, you took a step forward and got right in front of my gun and took me out of the fight. And I almost put, you know, and, and, and Sims that can kill you too. Right. Yeah. You're talking about a couple inches, the Sim round, right. in the, the base of the base of the skull, that's not, you know, not a good place to be. Fortunately, you know, he was very, very skilled and didn't shoot me, but yeah, there's a lot of kind of, training assumptions that we make where we we try to integrate automatic responses in people right and and you do enough of that those things are going to happen whether they make sense or not yeah there, there's so many of these and we call yeah. them training scars for lack of a better term i guess but this automated response that i, I think a well-intentioned instructor wanted to do that but it, i think it has to be contextual as if not, because again, I'm shooting from behind cover. Now I got to do a mag change and I'm aggressively stepping in <laughs> out from behind cover. It just doesn't make any sense, guys. Yeah. So again, keep it contextualized. Um, let's see what the, which kind of leads into my next point, And that is talking about priming. And yeah. we were, Mike and I, a couple months ago, were training a very large uh, police department and they uh, they had to give a teach back, and one of them was, and I've I've talked about this on the show. Those of you that are watching or listening are probably sick of this example, but I saw it twice from this department in one week, and that that was a fundamental misunderstanding of recognition prime decision making. So they uh, they have a target there, Dusty, and the target I've already looked at it. It's a silhouette of a man. His hands are open. You can see this person. You know, it's a silhouette of a man. His hands are open. And so this officer gets brought up to the seven yard line and the officer running the range goes, okay. Um, when this target turns and faces, just address the threat target turns and faces and he draws and fires two rounds center mass scans and reholsters. He's like, what do you think about that? Rich, that's recognition prime decision-making. Okay. I said, okay, cool. So what you trained this officer to do is shoot unarmed people when they turn and face it. And like, well, no, I mean, it's, it's a threat target. I said, no, it's not. Look at the target again. I said, this officer shouldn't have shot anybody. And we went, and, and I said, again, if the news yep. crew is out here filming this or, or whatever, you're just creating a problem, not a problem of optics so much, but a problem of we're failing to understand what we're trying to do. And I'll give you one other case oh, that, yeah. that week was, okay, so the call comes out, the officer gets a call that there's a, a shooter with a gun at the mall. Okay. So he's going to roll up in his cruiser and this was a drill they were running. Well, because of the constrictions of the flat range and time, they just had the officers that were just acting as part of the people in the mall. They got their weapon slung over the back. They got rifles slung over their back. So as the officer runs up, what does he see? He sees a sea of people walking with rifles and with rifles. maneuver through them and then fire on someone else that has a rifle. And I'm like, guys. And they're again, they're telling me, no, this is recognition prime decision-making. Wow. I said, I don't think you understand what that term means. Can you unpack some of that? Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. A little, <laughs> we, got, we got a lot to unpack here. Oh, I know. It, yeah. It, yeah. Um, so yeah. All right. Where are you even to start? Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so priming was, so first let me start back at the, at the basics, right? Priming in the context of teaching is you're, you're, you're giving somebody, something or i'm talking about a brand new student getting material because I we're, we're talking actually about two different things here so i want to make sure people aren't getting confused mm -hmm. right so so when you're priming a, a new skill for a student remember their brain has this filter right and so you're understanding that 90 percent of what you give them is not going to get through this filter right and so if you think about what when we communicate right like we're communicating right now there's what i think i say there's what i actually say 
there's what each person listening to this hears is what they understand and then there's going to be what they remember right and all of those are going to be different things right and so it is very 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 difficult as an instructor to consistently get information out to a group of people because each one of them is going to get different amounts of what you're putting out that's getting through their filter right so that's the first piece and the second piece is some massive percentage of what you're putting out is not even getting into short-term memory and therefore it's impossible for them to learn it right so that's mechanically how this works so what priming is in in that this first context i'm talking about it right is i'm going to give you the information i'm going to teach it you're going to practice it and I have zero expectation whatsoever that you retain a freaking thing that I told you. And we're going to go away and we're going to leave for 24 to 48 hours. And then we come back and we're going to start at ground zero. And I'm going to assume you've never seen this before and you know nothing. But here's the thing. Even though your brain didn't get most of that information, it still has a residual imprint of it. And it will let it through the filter next time, right? So you're going to get a much more... Um, much more effective transfer of the information in those short-term memory, which now gives you the re the chance to actually teach it and potentially retain it, right? So that that that's c priming in the first context. Um, I think, and Rich, correct me if I'm wrong. I think what you're talking about in recognition prime decision making is we are trying to use this. We're trying to get you familiar with the stimulus or an environment so that that triggers you to a certain set of decision making or skill performance or whatever. We want to make you familiar with this. Um, and I, I guess that's a similar thing, right? But now we're talking about something associative, not not just fundamental learning mechanics, right? Well, it helps um, them make rapid decision making too, right? I mean, it's yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it does. I, yeah, it, it does. And I want to come back to this as well. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about Hebb's law and, and myelination, right? So yeah. as, as, as a circuit gets myelinated and there's other, again, there's other stuff like astrocytes specializing in communications and synapses and stuff like that. Um, like it's, it's way outside of my ability to talk about the, the signal transmission in a circuit can increase the speed of it can increase like 50 to a hundred times as that circuit gets specialized. Right. So you're actually talking about, there's all kinds of things that happen. And one of them is actual faster signal transmission, right? Like, like you're actually processing the information faster, right? Another thing that can happen is you get a lot of, of time dedicated in certain contexts and environments is that context can, or, or application of what you're doing can make more of your brain be involved, right? So there's a, there, there's a principle and there's a, 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 a I explain a little bit of this in neuro and give the reference of the book neuro and give the references. Um, it's called a use dependent cortical reorganization where the more that we use something and we apply context to it, right? And that kind of stuff, your brain will actually dedicate more of its resources, right? More of its geographical brain structure to performing that task or to performing that set of tasks, right? So, um, but another component of this, I think, and this I think goes back to kind of what we talked about with that that OODA loop and trying to have priorities and sort of pre-make decisions. If you experience have experienced this before, so you don't necessarily need to go cognitively process all that. You understand, okay, I've seen this, and I'm now getting a jump on the decision making because I understand the framework, right? And, and so that that is incredibly important as an you know, again, in, in training environments, but you're a hundred percent right. It is so, so important that we don't frame and prime things that we don't want people to do, right. Or have them do things we don't want. Cause it, here's another component of this, right? So if we think about um, the way that we have always trained people, not because of what we're trying to teach them to do, but just because of the limitations of our training tools, we have always stacked up, skill sequences for people we've given them a queue of skill sequences to perform and what we expect them to do in the training environment is finish the skill sequence or finish the queue of skill sequences and solve all the problems to finish the queue of skill sequences and so the way that this works up here is we're basically writing subroutines right so, so say for example the skill sequences well, I'm going to pick something a little absurd here, right? Like you get a malfunction and so now I'm going to, and you'll see people do some goofy stuff who've trained. I know you guys see it on the range, right? Like say I'm going to, I'm going to tap, I'm going to rack, and then I'm going to do some weird check and I'm going to rip the mag out and I'm going to stick another mag in and I'm going to 
you know, do whatever. And if somebody's trained to do some really bizarre, goofy stuff, like a, a guy sent me a thing the other day as someone that was doing a, what it was, it was a, he was shooting, pulling the mag out, throwing the gun, drawing an empty gun, sticking the mag in or whatever. And it was some like goofy YouTube thing or whatever. Right. Like, but it's just like, you do that enough. You might actually do that. Right. Like you may pull the mag out and throw your loaded gun away and then go for an empty gun. That's not there. Right. If you practice that enough, right. Like we can do goofy stuff like this if we practice it and contextualize it inappropriately. Um, and so, um, like from that perspective, right, we, we've always taught people to do these skill sequences around the completion. What we do is we build what are skill sequences that are very difficult to interrupt, right? And so you, you'll see this in some of these law enforcement shootings, right, that look really, really bad on, on body camera, right, where somebody initiates a skill sequence. And like the example that I use for this, right, when, when I speak about it is I play that video from Office Space where Peter's trying to get out before Lombard shows up and asks him to work for the weekend, right? And he tries to turn his computer off, right? And it's just running through its exit, right? And it's like the, you know, compiling data or whatever, like, and he's trying to get out of the cubicle and he can't, right? And then he gets ambushed, right? He thinks he's clear and like gets ambushed by Lombard on his six, right? On his way out of the cubicle. Um, but in some respects, that's what our brains do. We hit play on the subroutine and, and I've had this happen to me, fortunately, not operationally, but in training where it's almost like I'm watching myself do something I know I don't want to do, but I can't stop it. Right. Like I remember, uh, it, it, it was this, this hand to hand thing that we did and, uh, with in this, this selection program that I did and, uh, so you're doing the instructor, and he was a very nice guy, right? And he's like, okay, we're going to do this. And he wanted us to do something because we're doing it, like, close quarters with Sims, right? And he's wearing this chest protector because he's going to have, like, 50 people shooting this morning, right? So it's like, you're going to shoot me right here, right? Well, at that range, I would, like, I mean, just training and, like, visualization or whatever, like, I'm going to shoot you in the most effective place, which is most assuredly not where he wanted me to shoot him. And even though I'm like, I, I have cognitively said, this is what I'm going to do. And we're doing everything really slow. Like I shot him in the place that I would have shot him for real. And I'm just like, oh, right. His lip is bleeding. And I'm just like, oh, am I going to get kicked out of this program? Right. And he's looking at me like I'm a moron and he's legitimately mad at me. And I'm like, you know, but like I've had this happen to me personally where you've got this this routine that you've kind of pre-programmed and you're like watching yourself do it going like, why can't I stop this from happening? Right. And so we have to be very careful on how we build this stuff in training. And that's actually kind of leads into this new, new technology that we've been building is all about how do we fix that? How do we fix that at a fundamental level? So, yeah, and but I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I want to get into your technology in a second. I tell you yeah, that, yeah. that is so that is so important to understand that. And if it has not happened to you, I tell you, train long enough and I promise you it will. Yeah. I could give example after example, but uh, I think m many people on here know exactly what I'm, what we're talking about. And uh, Tony says, we're going to need a round two, three, four with Dusty. Yeah, probably if he's willing to do that, definitely. Cause there's a, so much more to go into. Uh, Greg says, any thoughts on what is missing from our training curriculum? It seems that we have a lot of, uh, technical elements, but mind training seems sparse. Yeah. 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 Um, so, well, I mean, I, I'll just give you the warning on the book neuro. It is super, super dense and very, very, very technical. Um, that is what that book is about. And I'll just summarize it here as saying like, you're right. It's, it's the mind training piece, right? Like we can teach people, well, I can, Mike and Rich, <laughs> Mike and Rich can teach people to shoot, right? Um, and like, in, in terms of like, we, we know basically what, what are the physics and the mechanics of how to handle a gun and make the gun operate at basically that limit of what the human being can do and the tool can do, right? Like we, we, we basically have that kind of nailed down. Um, the, the challenge that we've, we've always had, right, and this is, is kind of what, what led us into the, the path of what, why building shooters as a company, not just, you know, me writing books and some articles and stuff, um, is, is, is recognizing that, uh, and this gets into a, a part of a, a question I skipped earlier, right? Like, we've never had a good way to measure performance that's relevant to the operational side. And then in our training environments, we've never had a way to, to 
contextualize the skills with all of that other stuff that's relevant, right? Or like neuroplastically connect all the relevant components of the brain, like object recognition, motion detection, spatial awareness, uh, the application of of policy, the application of, of law, right? Like all of this stuff we have to do for real, right? Integrating mobility skills, right? Even like mobility with micro terrain and how important that is in real world tactical settings, right? Like, you know, uh, how often if people were 10 feet over there behind the car, would there be no shooting, right? Versus a horrible shooting, right? Like, or, you know, walk 15 feet over there behind a wall 15 seconds earlier and there's no contact, right? Versus contact where, where everybody gets hurt, right? So like, like understanding the stuff and be able to integrate that kind of thinking and, and make that thinking a part of the shooting skill, right? Is, is the part that we've been missing for a long time. Which is, a, a, is exactly what Gregory says here. He says it's why we need to build thinking fighters, not just shooters that are skilled at drills. Yeah. And that's exactly what, that's one of the things that we try to get across is uh, under, being able to communicate the why to a student. Like, and Mike and I see this every single yeah. firearms instructor class. And that is when we tell a student, you're going to give a class on something at the end of the week. Right. So they'll come up and say, okay, uh, Rich, I want to run, I'm going to run the two, three, 21 drill or whatever, you know, stupid thing is going on. I'm like, okay, what skill are you trying to teach? What we'll see in the drill. I'm like, no, no, no stop. What skill are you trying to teach? And then right. why is that important? I get you're going to use the drill to reinforce this, but right. I don't, forget the drill for a minute. But so much, so many people in our community are so focused on this drill and they lose sight of what are we trying to teach and what context is this going to be important to the adult learner? Absolutely. Um, tell us about neuro. Yeah, so uh, this kind of ties together a lot of what we've been talking about. And I think John talked about it, right? So I can show you a, a 3D printed prototype of the basic basic yeah. deal here. Um, and we've got we got our first 100 manufactured units around the way. Uh, I know Rich is, Rich is going to be one of the first people getting them. He's excited. Um, so the idea was we... We sat down, this is back in, in 2016, shortly after publication of Building Shooters. Um, and I was actually watching an on, like, like I, I got misquoted in an online argument and tagged in it, right? Which kind of pulled me into it, pulled me into a discussion um, that I didn't participate in, but I watched, right? And I was watching, you, you know, and I, I know everybody here is probably going to laugh about this because we've all seen it or probably all of us have been involved in it at some point, right? You get like, two like alleged gurus and then their acolytes start fighting it out right like in the kind of like the comment section below <laughs> sort of thing and, and, I, and i'm watching these discussions go on and i'm like you know both sides of this discussion are actually right and i don't think either side fully is i don't think either side is recognizing the value of what the other side is saying right and and, and i and I, I it kind of right it's like the blinding flash of the obvious or, or whatever i'm like uh um I stole that from Andy Stanford, by the way. He likes to say that. Uh, is is, um, you know, the problem is we just don't have any tools, right? We've never had a tool to relevantly measure performance, right? Because one side of the discussion was sort of going on the, you know, we, we need to get away from measurement because measurement pushes us into discrete drills, and discrete drills basically remove all the rest of this thinking and, and performance, right? W which is true, right? It, it, it is a fundamental problem. And so if all you do is go shoot these discrete drills, you're really good at the discrete drill, put somebody in context and they're just staring at you and confused, right? And can't perform. And you see that in force on force training with people that all they do is shoot competition. Shooting competition, my personal opinion, is a fantastic thing to do, right? Like, and I think that, I, but Mike told me the last time I was, I, saw him at that at that course because like i think that argument settled and i'd agree with that right like personally uh but at the same time if all you do is shoot competition and competitive drills and you don't ever integrate it it could cause problems right and trainers that run a lot of force on force will see that right um but at the same time if all you do is this big integrative like force on force thing you never actually learn the shooting skills that's exactly right, right. You, you know and, and so that's the problem right like yeah i've got all of this like tactical wizardry but if the or you know tactical knowledge and whatever and i've got all this context and decision making but if solving your problem requires you to perform 
this level of shooting skill and you've never developed that. And, and more to the point, this is really what hitting in combat gets into, um, the science behind this, more to the point, the way that you have developed this has precluded you from ever being able to learn those fundamental shooting skills. You got a problem, yep. right? Uh, maybe not prevented you, but precluded you, right? Like, okay, if you're going to actually do this for real, you got 20 years of therapy ahead of you to fix yourself, right? Like, um, we, we don't want to get into that spot either. And so, so, so what, what I wanted to come up with was something, A, that would allow us to measure performance in new ways, right? That would integrate all this relevant stuff in there, and that would, that would give us the ability to integrate those things like object recognition, motion detection, spatial awareness, context, peripheral vision, situational awareness, decision making, uh, the application of declarative knowledge, the integration of cognitive function in the shooting, and tie all of this stuff together in a way that is... Um, scalable from the perspective of how the brain learns, right? Like not, I'm going to take day one, week one shooter and drop them into force on force training and try to expect them to learn grip and trigger management there. Cause that's not going to be effective, right? Like how do I take someone where I'm able to teach them in the way that the brain learns and receives information and build really solid fundamental shooting skills where I can measure performance um, without getting rid of all the rest of the stuff. And so what we came up with was, uh, it, well, the other part of this was how do I make it affordable and scalable, right? How do I make it so that Rich and, and Jeff and Tony and Greg, if they want to do it, right? Not that it's going to be free, right? But they can buy this thing. They can integrate it. And that as they start to learn, right, and start to integrate the rest of their thinking into their brain, right, they can start building on this and create things that are more complex, right? And how do I take the same tool and make it applicable to institutional trainers, right, or civilian trainers, um, and that's actually been the real challenge with it is building a user interface and then communications and networking architecture that gets us from like individual dude that shoots once a month and wants to to do this to, uh, you know, integrating with like live fire CQB and maybe with role players and CQB and all of that kind of stuff. Right. Like um, and, and qualifications for range where you got thousands of devices. Right. That's been the real challenge that we're I think we're, we're finally kind of getting over the hump with that um with that now but so what we did is we looked at what's the cheapest simplest way i can do that and so basically what we did is we strapped three laser pointers on top of a shot timer um and then we're using uh we, there, there's some limitations in direct sunlight right but we use some projection lenses to give us shapes um and if, if you look at the brain science which again this is all in neuro we modulate that or we blink the lights we can stimulate all the motion detection circuitry and now i've got a one-to-one -one ratio of projections to target and i'm not limited to a screen right i can project on bobs now right so i can make I can make three-dimensional targets behave. This thing's small enough and light enough. I can put it on a moving target. So now I have a moving thing that behaves and we don't have targets anymore. We just have subjects, right? So kind of to your point, Rich, uh, where you're dealing with these, with these, with these guys, right? Where you're just in this assumed thing where when the target shows up, I shoot it. Right. Yep. And that's not a, I mean, I mean, it is a lack of thinking, right? But it's not necessarily, and it is carelessness on the part of the student, but it's really not the student's fault. Right. It's the fact that we have we have built this contextual framework for them, which is turning target, shoot the target, yep. right? Um, or target appears, right? You think about like the pop-up stuff, target appears, I shoot it. Or, I mean, think about the impacts of this, right? Like look at the color of the target based on the color of the target, decide whether to shoot or not, right? By the physical characteristics of what the target I make that shooting decision. Um, and that's the part of my brain that I've wired into whether or not I apply deadly force. So what we want to do is get away from all that and make everything behave and be able to apply context and decision making and real spatial relationships, right? I can now have a target at six inches or excuse me, a subject at six inches from me that behaves, right? I can have things behind me, right? And in all different directions. Um, and so that, that was, has been the focus of uh, what we've been doing for the last five or six years. And we're, 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 we're completely there electrically and mechanically, right? Still kind of iron out the bugs on our software, but. Well, I, yeah. I love it. Uh, and I want to talk about, you know, like the first guy I ever arrested. Yeah. I was a brand new, I mean, I hadn't even been to the Academy yet. I came over. Right. Uh, and so my FTO goes, okay, Rich, uh, this guy is called comm center. And he says, uh, he wants to turn himself in. Turns out he's got active warrants from California 
and uh, he was going to turn himself in. He's supposed to be on the corner of Main Street and whatever. Okay, so I pulled down yeah. there and I see him. he's an African American male, and he's sitting on the curb with his back to me. So as I approach him, I say, uh, you know, hey pal, or or whatever like that. And the guy jumps up and does this, and you know, I've got my hand on my gun because I'm I'm a little nervous. This is the first guy I've ever arrested. My FTL right. is not even getting out of the car. And this is a large African-American male wearing a hoodie. And when he jumps up and faces me, I see this. And if I had done, you know, recognition, prime decision-making, that dude might've got shot. But what he was holding in his hand, it was black and facing me like this. It was a Bible. And he's like, yeah, I was reading in my Bible last night that what I'd done was wrong and I should turn myself in. So again, to, to Gregory's point about, we need to build thinking fighters that, that aren't just shooters. Right. You know, I think that, we have to be able to use the brain and it's just why I love what you're doing. And the other thing I love about your product that you got coming out, if I understand it correctly, is we're using a visual, a visual stimulus instead of relying on auditory because our training right now is I get an auditory stimulus to fire the shot a lot of times. Right. 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 But that's not how it's going to be in a defensive context. I'm not no. going to get it. Maybe there, there's something right. A hammer cocking. I don't know what it is, but, more often than not, I'm going to see the suspect do something right. that, ne that he needs to be shot right now. Yeah, <laughs> It's not going to be, I hear it. So if you could talk more to what the visual stimulus is, I don't know how far down the ro road you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Down. Yeah, yeah. So um, so there's there's basically two options with this, right? So there's there are laser pointers, right? So you can obviously get the laser dots. And when you're before you're up front, when you're outside, you're limited to the laser dots. That's the reality, right? Because because there's some limitations of physics. I do have a way around that, but it will, it, it's ways out and there's some R and D like physics and stuff involved. Right. Um, so initially it will be available for at least the next couple of years. You're going to be limited to the dots outside direct sunlight. Um, when you get to, uh, to like indoor environment or like, you know, lower light or whatever. Now I've got um, uh, the ability to project shapes. And so you've got multicolored shapes, which you can orient in different directions, right? So I can now assign meanings to shapes and orientations and colors of shapes and orient, right? Meaning to, uh, I'm stumbling over myself here, shapes, colors of shapes and orientations of shapes and combinations of shapes and orientations of shapes. So back to the point about the cognitive, think of integrating Kim's games into... Yeah. Explain that, please, Kim's game. Yeah, so uh, 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 keep in mind, stupid, right? So this is something people do in like, uh, like snipers and observers are do it, right? It was basically, I didn't practice my observation skills, right? And so I, I was explaining this to a sheriff who's actually the first um, first people that, that bought the neurosystem from us. Um, and I was like, you know, so, so what do you do when you're trying to get people to pass your qualification now, right? What do you tell them, right? You tell them, all right, and, and this is, not necessarily what you should be telling people, but it's very common, right? Relax, just kind of ignore everything, let the world fade away, like, like, don't, you know, just focus on the front side or focus on your sight picture, right? And you're particularly when you're trying to get people to pass, like on these aggregate scoring things, right? It's like everyone's failing at the 15 and the 25, right? So you just relax, you ignore everything. Well, what are we teaching people to do and what are we building? We are associating, again, getting back to that associative, associative stuff, we're associating a gun in my hand with reduced situational awareness and reduced cognitive function. Because every time they have a gun in their hand, we don't expect situational awareness. We don't expect cognitive function and they are going to perform better. Or at least that's what we've taught them. They'll perform better with reduced cognitive function and reduced situational awareness. And that is a limitation in many ways of the training tools and the measurement methods that we've had. Right? So, with neuro what we're doing right and i'm john and i are realizing this right now as we finally have these things where they're starting to work and we can use them is like i need to relearn to shoot right i mean like legitimately like i need to relearn to shoot from scratch because i don't have this information processing even though both of us have done you know a, a fair amount of tactical stuff and close quarters battle and stuff like i don't have this information processing built into my shooting skills right like i need to go back at ground level and build it in there, um, right? And build the thinking and build the peripheral vision and the, the, the awareness stuff um, and make it part of what I do with shooting. So um, 
again, like, like think about the difference there from future, right? Like sh shooter now, right? Like person that trains a lot, they get a gun in their hand and they use very specific circuits and like the rest of their brain basically gets foggy and goes away. Right. Versus future shooter trained with neuro from like day one, when they get the gun in their hand, they get this access to more of their brain, right? It's like you get a gun in your hand, you get hyper aware, you see more, you process more, and you understand more, and you have better situational awareness versus worse, right? It's kind of a complete change in the paradigm with a very simple tool. And like, it's, it's really, really cool to start actually being able to use it now and play with it. Um, and I feel like I squirreled off in this part of your question there. So can you re-ask it if I did that? <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, my brother, uh, Jeff says some people who are hyper impulsive have been a challenge to instruct. And just for context, you know, Jeff was a Marine, then was a coast yeah. guard, uh, law enforcement officer and was on the international training team. So Jeff was going from, you know, West Africa one day to the Caribbean, to Latvia, to gotcha. Montenegro and, and, and then there's the cultural aspects of learning too, you know, which, which is probably more psychology than neuroscience, yeah. which plays in, in some, some aspect of that, I'm sure. Yeah. So let me, let me just address that real quick with training structure. So this is something that, that so right now with our, our assumed training structures, there's, there, there's a, a huge lift on a good instructor, right? Because you, give a crap about your students, right? And so you're trying to, right, I mean, you're trying to do magic, right? Like levitation and fireballs out of your rear kind of stuff to try to reach the student and to try to impart something to them and, and to get them to understand what's going on. But the, it, but the reality is, is the training structures for the most part are totally misaligned with how the student can receive and learn information. So the massive lift is really on the student where you can make the information available to them, right? If you're an amazing instructor, you're going to reach them and they understand it's important and then they have to go learn it on their own, right? That's just un the unfortunate reality of where we're at. And so the hyper impulsive guy that's always going to want to jump ahead, right? Or whatever, that can be very, very difficult to deal with. When you start teaching in a brain-based setting, like one of the huge values of that is you basically take not all of it, right? You still have to have good instructors and students still have to care, right? But you take a huge amount of the burden off of both the instructor and the student because you're using a system that matches with how they naturally learn and you're doing things that will make them learn, which is totally different than what we do now. So, um, Think of it this way, right? So you got a bunch of entry level people and you got this, this hugely disparate range of where people are, or sometimes probably to your point, Jeff, where people think they are like versus where they actually are. Um, and that's very difficult to deal with, right? Because you're either going to screw these students up over here, right? Because you've gone way past what they're capable of learning, or this guy over here is going to be completely bored, right? But if you're able to shorten those time frames, right, and deliver information and in kind of like more acute, like very focused amounts, like even on, okay, like day one, where you're just teaching people to load and unload the gun, yeah, the guy that can do that's probably a little bored, right? Okay, but he can suck up being bored for a half hour without like completely getting catastrophic, right? Like anybody can deal with that. When you get into the fundamentals, right? And Rich, tell me if I'm wrong here. Um, like, hey, we're just going to work on grip. Spending 20 to 30 minutes just sitting there, like really ironing out your grip, even in a non-dynamic environment, is not a waste of time, no. right? Like I'd be amazed if you or even Mike would not sit there for a half hour, right? If he ended up in a class like that and be like, I am getting benefit out of this because I know what to do with it, right? And I don't have to go ahead of this drill because I can sit there and really iron out, right? Like maybe there's some micro, like, I mean, Mike's on a different level. I don't even understand what he says, right? When he starts talking about that, but like there's some minor component of this I want to tweak, right? Like something we wouldn't even, or I wouldn't even understand what they're talking about that he can play with in that 30 minutes where he's manipulating and working on his grip and he's not wasting his time even though he's going back, he's, he's working on totally different stuff, right? But he's doing the same drill. And so you take a huge burden off the instructor when you're able to break down training this way. I don't know if that, that answered Jeff's question or, 
was helpful. But yeah, brain-based training and delivering training in those smaller amounts takes a huge burden off the student and the instructor, puts a lot of it on the training system itself. No, I love that. And th there's one other component, and that is this, this, um, that hairless bipedal primates, man. You know what we all want to do? We all want to do the advanced training, the ninja stuff. And uh, <laughs> you, know, you said it a while ago, uh, Dusty, and that was like, if you can't shoot, why am I wasting my time teaching you how to do vehicle CQB? I mean, if, if when you right. finally get the firearm out and on target, you can't hit the target. So, so many people want to rush that training paradigms. Like, well, I went to Dave Spaulding's course or I went to Mike Seeklander's defensive hangar. I'm ready for this advanced CQB course. Uh, and it's like, no, you're not. Yeah. Um, and, and that idea of what do you mean? No, I'm not. Uh, my, my cousin was in the national guard. He taught me how to shoot at a hay bale. I'm ready to go. I'm like, right. No, you're not ready to go. But again, when you're an instructor that makes a living teaching yeah, and the market wants the ninja class and you know that the market is not ready for the ninja class, I know it has nothing to do with neuroscience, but it, it's, it's, it's part of just the way people are, I guess, human yeah. nature. Yep. T go ahead. Yeah, no. I'm I was just going to ask you, uh, Dusty, we're coming up on uh, going on two hours, my friend. Holy smokes. Yeah, time flies, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. Will Parker says, I've been around guns my whole life. I want to go fast. Yeah, I'm sure you. Yeah, Will <laughs> hears that all the time. Will has a training company out in Montana. It's, gotcha. it's very frustrating. Having seen the events of 2020 and some of the yeah. things that have happened here in 2021 and going on around the world, man, where is all this lawlessness headed? Man, I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell you. Like I, 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 I don't know. Like it's um, there, there, there's certainly some very disturbing things. Like I, mean, I wasn't, I wasn't around in the '60s, obviously. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's ever, and and and, and it could be I'm wrong about this, but certainly in my lifetime, like there's always been people that had disagreement with, like, you know, uh where what the government was doing or what the military was doing or i don't you know this but i've never seen uh a like large particularly like large block of people who are actually working in the government right or are like elected representatives who seem to fundamentally hate the country mm. right i think the country is like rotten at the core um and man i i don't know like i said i, I wish i had a crystal ball on that but that's uh I wish you did it's, too. It's it's kind of disturbing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what can a reasonable, responsible armed citizen do with what, what, what we see uh, going on in our country right now? Yeah. So I wrote two things down for this. Right. Um, so the first one, right. Cause I know you're going to, you're going to ask about training here, right. In a minute. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to preempt you on that. So I'd say don't buy what I call the false choice. Right. And, and what I mean by the false choice is that like, I have to be like tactical super ninja or do nothing. Right. It's kind of like, you know, the, I got to run super marathons or not work out at all. Right. And, and, and that's really not the case. Right. Like, um, you know, there, there, there's a, there's an upfront investment that's required to develop gun safety and develop the fundamentals of gun handling and the fundamentals of shooting. And obviously the more you train and the, you know, the, the more you practice and whatever, the better you're going to be. Like, there's no argument about that. Um, but you know, you don't have to be tactical super ninja to acquire functional skills. Um, and you don't have to shoot, you know, 40 hours a week to, to maintain functional skills either. Now I'm not saying don't train, right. By all means train, train as much as you can, but don't fall into this. Like, well, because I can't be tactical super ninja and become a master class shooter, I shouldn't do it at all. Um, like, I think that's just kind of, a, uh, something a lot of people make the assumption of. And I think I, I've seen a couple articles by trainers recently that are kind of along that line of like. You know, the, the people that are really influential in the industry tend to be the tactical super ninja folks, right? And a lot of people are motivated by the entertainment side, right? Which kind of gravitates to that, you know, like we, as we've been talking about the, you know, vehicle CQB or, you know, whatever classes, which is, you know, which is great and it's fine. But like at the same time, um, you know, learning the fundamental skills is going to, is going to take you a lot farther than that. You don't have to be tactical super ninja to do that. So that would be the first kind of the first piece is, um, 
have a dedicated training program, work on that. There's not a, you know, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm putting in a plug for Mike and Rich here only because they're two of the best at it, right? Like they've, the stuff they put together with American Warrior Society and that, like there's just not too many better places to get information um, that's out there. So that would be uh, one of them. And the second thing, what a reasonable, responsible armed citizen person can do um there's the social side right like stay involved keep talking to people we have a tendency to kind of get tribal and i only talk to people that agree with me um it is it's a shame that it's kind of gotten to the point where there are some subjects where it seems like we can't even discuss them anymore because there are potentially permanent like professional consequences right like you have a real job you discuss some subjects that a couple of years ago wouldn't even have been controversial and now you can be permanently banned and lose your job. So that's, yeah. you know, one of those things is very disturbing, but, um, you know, I think, uh, to the extent that we can like staying involved and talking to people and, and trying to reduce this, you know, oppositional tribalism that, that we sort of seem to be devolving into, um, I, I think is a good thing on the tactical side. Um, kind of getting back into the context you were talking about earlier, recognize that to be a victim of violent crime, you have to be, co basically you have to be co-located at the same time with the person who's inflicting that violent crime on you. So, um, and I'll tell you this as a protective operations guy, mobility is a lot more important than your shooting skills. Yes. Right. Situational awareness and mobility are a lot more important than your shooting skills. And the best gunfight is the one you didn't show up to. Yeah, yeah, I, like at, at least the vast majority of the time, there, there, you know, there's some direct action stuff. Sometimes you gotta, sometimes you're the initiator, but um, that probably is not going to be the case for too many people in the civilian world. Yeah, and uh, I heard Paul Howe recently say something to that tune. Paul Howe, of course, is a former Delta operator, and he says, you know, I didn't like. Uh, to run a lot of body armor, I would run the smallest plate that they would allow me to run because I'm going to use speed and mobility and i'm going to use pieces of of my terrain you know the cover that's presented to right. me uh is going to be what i use instead of relying on some sort of sappy plate on my kit but uh so yeah i totally agree with that jesse says sometimes you need to tell people they just aren't ready rich and mike told me i wasn't ready to be an instructor when i took their mm. farm instructor development course and it lit the fire that i didn't realize i let get extinguished and i think that that that's true. And Jesse, you know, I, I appreciate you being honest enough to, to say that in this forum because Mike and I do give feedback and sometimes you got an ugly baby. We're, we're going to tell you, and we're, I'm going to try to coach it in the, the, the best language possible to not offend anyone. But we had in this case, the uh, students in that class, I lined them all up and marched them down range and made them look at their targets. I'm like, there should be four headshots on these targets. Look what they are. And I want you to look at them because this is unacceptable. And part of that goes back to, well, I'm the 40 hour instructor, right? Well, maybe you're not just because you have that title or you even have that billet doesn't mean that you're where you need to be. Right. And you get there by reading stuff like this uh, from people that, you know, I can, I can read Dusty's books and acquire, uh, uh, you know, like you said, I may come away with, eight things maybe and i've highlighted and dog-eared that book and then i can put that into practice so i think we have to be continually learning continually being a student and can't think i have all the answers i think that's a logical fallacy when we do that stop learning yeah, absolutely dusty where can people find you and your products yeah so uh really easy building shears.com um, is probably the best way to look at our stuff and get in touch with us. I see Tony's asking how to get in touch with me. Yes. Either shoot me an email through the website or uh, you can, uh, we also have a Facebook page. It's Building Shooters on Facebook. Um, I think we're, uh, we have a Twitter account, which is like BLDG underscore SHTRS or something like that. You can get the link on our website and then uh, uh, Building Shooters on LinkedIn as well. Yeah, Tony, hit me through Facebook or send an email through the website, and we'll link up off the offline. And and I'll have links to Dusty's uh, website and all of his products, some of his products, I shouldn't say all of them, in today's show notes. You can find them there. Rob Pincus is on. He says, I just pulled a quote out of Dustin's latest book for a project I'm working on. Really appreciate him pushing down the road of applying the latest brain stuff to the way we develop applicable skills. Much respect. 
Hey, thanks, Rob. Appreciate yeah. that. Appreciate that, Rob. Yeah. And, and again, nobody else is doing this for our community. So yeah. it's so important that, that we understand this. You don't need to be a neuroscientist, but you need to understand the architecture of the brain and how your student's going to process that information. And if you don't, you're just going to keep scratching your head as, why do they just not get it? And yeah. I love, I love the way you answered the question earlier about what makes a good instructor. I think you said something along the lines of it's your students results that yeah. will tell whether you're a good instructor or not. i I love that answer. Well, Dusty, we've been on here for two hours, my friend. Any closing <laughs> thoughts? Uh, yeah, I just will throw it out there. Um, and uh, I'm always up for criticism. I'd love to, I would love to pretend that we've got it all figured out or I've got it all figured out. Uh, but a lot of times uh, you learn the most when somebody punches you in the face and you realize you screwed something up. So um, love having discussions on this stuff. If you're uh, particularly military and law enforcement guys in particular, uh, definitely don't hesitate to send us an email. I do try to help guys with training design and I do the vast majority of that for free when I, you know, when it's supportable. So um, don't, uh, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help you. Well, and if you call or, or reach out to him and you get a hold of, John Marvel, uh, then you're you're in good hands because John there's no is a, question. Yeah. John is an incredible shooter, operator, uh, amazing man, a talented guy. You're lucky to have him on your team. So uh, if you reach out to them to get a hold of John, <laughs> man, you you are you're on the road. Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dusty, and thank you for everybody that watched this live. Everybody that's going to watch on Coffee with the Rich YouTube page. Everybody that's going to listen to the podcast. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to check out our amazing sponsors. And remember, the fight is coming. Be ready. Thanks, Rich.